Okie doke. I want to talk today not only about vitamin C, but what vitamin C has done, what it's doing now, and what we can anticipate it to do in the future, not only by itself, but we're starting to see many increased applications with combination with other with other agents. I think Certainly people that have focused on vitamin C like me in the past, we tended more to look at vitamin C as a monotherapy by itself. And it's very good by itself for many things. But the lack of a adequate or perfect clinical response means there are other things that need to be addressed and I'll show you why on this. Now, very important if, if you're curious, curious and you want documentation, everything in the slide that has a literature reference has a number. Go to PubMed at their website, type in the number, hit search, you go immediately to the abstract of the article. Now in general, if I tell you something without qualification, it's pretty much an established fact. On the other hand, when I'm synthesizing the facts and giving you my opinion and experience and this out of the other, but it's not established in the literature. I'll try to make that clear. <clears throat> now, the overall thrust of this is I'm going to initially go through a bunch of slides to show you historically what vitamin C has already been established to do. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, although it's a subject you could go a couple hours on by itself. But I just want you to let you know that this history exists, it's there, it's in the literature, it's established. And then we'll go into a little bit of a theory of why vitamin C does what it does and why it has its clinical effects. Then we'll go into applications and then we'll go into some, shall I say, more modern synchronizations with vitamin C such as magnesium uh, and multiple other agents and tell you why these things are not only doing what they're doing but that we can anticipate them to do some even incredibly more fabulous things in the future once the information gets out and clinicians start applying it. Now, in vitro means in the test tube, outside of the body. Outside of the body, vitamin C has inactivated or destroyed every virus against which it's been tested. Every one. Okay, no exceptions. If there's a virus out there that is not destroyed by vitamin C, it just hasn't been tested, we don't know about it. Okay, but there's not been vitamin C has ever failed to destroy a virus against which it's been tested. Uh, notoriously, these are just a few examples. We have polio virus, herpes virus, vaccinia viruses for smallpox, enteroviruses, a lot of the cholera type of uh, agents, uh, not just the bacteria, vibrio, but other viruses, influenza, rabies virus. An interesting, interesting thing about the rabies virus is they actually infected animals with rabies viruses and the vitamin C nuke that as well. We always have to worry about the legal aspect of medicine these days, so legally a physician could not, unless he's in a small town and nobody knew about it, could not just treat a patient with rabies with vitamin C and not expect to get massacred, especially if he didn't have an optimal result would probably get massacred, ironically enough, even if he did have an optimal result. Now, so that's in the test tube. What about in the body? In the body, vitamin C also has been documented to nuke, destroy, and activate when adequately and properly dosed every single acute, remember acute versus chronic, acute 
viral syndrome against which it's been used and treated. And anytime there's a shortcoming in clinical result or clinical response, it virtually always relates to dose, dose and frequency, okay? Uh, penicillin, you know, kills a lot of different uh, bacteria, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, but it takes several million units to do it. So what do you think is going to happen when you use 500 units of penicillin? Not much. So if 10 grams of vitamin C are required to deal with something, what's going to happen when you use 500 milligrams? Not much. Now, very famous, well in my opinion very famous, uh, paper and result here by the father of clinical vitamin C therapy. Dr. Albert St. George, he discovered vitamin C and was given the Nobel Prize, but in my opinion, and this is not a slam on Dr. Pauling later on or Dr. St. George, but the true genius of vitamin C was Dr. Frederick Leonard. Somehow, after Dr. St. George discovered vitamin C and won the Nobel Prize, Dr. Kletter got this wild and crazy idea to start giving super mega doses of vitamin C to people with infections. Um, I'm still not exactly sure what he was thinking, but he was right. So, <clears throat> in the polio epidemic of 1947 or 48 in North Carolina, he saw a total of 60 infants and small children with polio. And at least half of those, this is important because modern medicine always likes to disparage things like this and say, oh, well, you didn't diagnose it correctly. It wasn't polio. Well, at least 50% of the cases of polio were documented by spinal tap. Now, in 57 out of 60, the polio was completely cured in three days. Three patients required two more days of therapy. So he cured 60 out of 60, which is pretty close to 100%. Now, he even took some advanced patients who already had flaccid paralysis in their limbs. That's like dead meat. And he was able to bring those back to complete and full function, but it just required several weeks of therapy rather than a few days. Leonard also found he could get a similar result by giving large doses of vitamin C orally, but for longer periods of time. Also, let me tell you, uh, at, the end of this, at the end of the presentation is my email address. Uh, you can feel perfectly free to email me if you want to have a copy of the lecture. Okay, and that way, so you don't have to go crazy taking pictures or notes. Uh, you can go right there and see the literature reference and look it up if you like. <coughs> Not surprisingly, the clinical results showed that higher doses given more quickly not only accelerated healing, but accelerated quality of healing. Vitamin, <laughs> vitamin C is intimately involved in the production of collagen and connective tissue. Okay, so what's important when you're healing a wound? Well, not just killing the bacteria, not just growing new tissue, but growing the structural parts so that you have a firm, tight scar and not a loose scar that will break open. Vitamin C does all of that. Uh, acute hepatitis, highly effective. Acute. Chronic is a different ballgame. Okay, there are reasons for that. And depending on your total treatment protocol, you can sometimes achieve cures even of chronic hepatitis. But as far as this quick, rapid, complete clinical cure, I'm talking about acute hepatitis. <clears throat> also, Dr. Cathcart, a true vitamin C pioneer, if you will, uh, in the San Francisco area, treated many thousands of patients over his time, and I think because he was a little worried about the FDA, he was a little reticent to use lots of intravenous vitamin C. But he became the master of super megadose oral vitamin C. 
and he pretty much showed the same thing with hepatitis you can achieve with oral. But we're talking about uh, 30, 40, 50, gram, 50 grams a day orally, uh, depending on whether or not it causes bowel tolerance. He also noted that when he was able to achieve this clinical cure, which was virtually 100% of the time, out of, I don't know, many hundreds, I think, of these hepatitis patients, he never had a patient evolve to chronic hepatitis, which again makes sense if you know you've completely nuked the virus, okay? This was his approach. Generally, uh, he would give IV if he could, and then he'd give oral with it. And this is sort of, if you will, I put together something I'll show you later on called the Multi-C Protocol. And really, Dr. Kletter was starting the Multi-C Protocol back then. It's logically speaking kind of crazy just to give somebody IV once or twice or three times a week in the clinic and not give them mega doses orally in between. Okay, you want to, the goal is to get as much vitamin C inside the body as possible. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> Amazingly enough, he also encountered a number of people who presented viral encephalitis in coma. And everyone that he reported on, he was able to bring out of coma in several hours and have them walking out of the hospital several days later. And those of you who haven't seen it, there's the New Zealand farmer with the swine flu. That was on New Zealand 60 Minutes. You can go to YouTube and type in uh, New Zealand 60 Minutes uh, swine flu uh, or go to my website, peakenergy.com, and, and take a look at that video. It's about 16 minutes. But let me tell you, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, you better have a box of Kleenex handy because it will pull you right out your chair. Now, what else has vitamin C been proven to do? Proven to do? Cure simple and complicated measles. Cure simple and complicated mumps. Cure acute herpes infections. Acute cure rabies in animals. Now, Look at the first two, measles and mumps. And this expands to all the things for which we give vaccinations. There's not a single thing that a vaccine prevents, if it prevents it at all, that is not readily curable by vitamin C. And we'll see that when you augment that vitamin C with magnesium, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, the efficacy goes up even more. Let me just do a quick aside, a quick jaw-dropping aside, and tell you that magnesium chloride as an oral solution given to babies and young children cures polio more quickly and more rapidly than the vitamin C did intravenously. It's, it's, it's stunning information, truly. And what's even more stunning with the magnesium chloride, and this will be in the new book, which just got back from the printer. What's even more stunning is that the French doctor who did this series of polio magnesium patients, I think he reported on about 15 of them, about six, five or six of them had already had polio for two, three, four, five months before he saw them. And in those patients, a number of them already had flaccid paralysis. And in all of them, he brought back the muscle function. I mean, some of them had residual limps, this sort of thing, okay? And some of them went from zero function to 70 or 80% function. But he brought back the irretrievable, okay? All the time that Kletter was doing this type of stuff, the American Medical Association, where he presented his information. He presented his information on this polio and hardly got a response. And the next person that was wildly attended 
was a doc speaking about polio patients in the Iron Lung. I mean, you tell me. Non-viral infections, highly effective for diphtheria, tetanus, staph, strep, pseudomonas. These have all been documented to be curable with vitamin C. And so, <clears throat> as a general rule, you can consider vitamin C to be an absolute virus side, killing all viruses. Almost always bacteriostatic. In other words, if it doesn't kill the bacterium, it stops it from reproducing, and then the immune system can kick in. And always supportive of the strong immune system. Uh, very effective non-viral infections, believe it or not, malaria, dysentery. Oh, wow. If you can knock out malaria and dysentery, I don't know what the figure is, you're probably saving several million people a year right there. Okay? Cholera, dysentery, uh, and, and not only more mortality, but morbidity as well. These are, uh, until you are cured, you're miserable uh, and you're completely dysfunctional in terms of doing a job or anything else. <clears throat> Leprosy, these sort of things, they respond to, but these are mycobacterium that grow extremely slowly. So basically anything that effectively treats a pathogen, much of the response rate depends on how quickly the pathogen multiplies. If it multiplies every few days, responds very slow. If it multiplies every few hours, responds very quick. Now, I'm not going to belabor all these. I just want to show you and briefly point out the fact that in the literature, if you see all the numbers, it's been documented that vitamin C has these effects on the immune system. Increases interferon production. Enhances the ability of white blood cells to chew up, consume pathogens. It selectively concentrates in white blood cells. It enhances both the function of T cells and B cells. It enhances the proliferation of the immune T cells and B cells. It enhances the antibody response of a B cell. That's what produces your antibodies or B cells. And when they encounter an antigen, if there's a lot of vitamin C around, you're going to produce more antibody. Antigen antibody, vaccine. I don't think I have a slide on this later on, so let me make this aside right now. I don't know if we're going to win the war upright with vaccinations. Okay. I mean, in my opinion, vac vaccines have destroyed more brains and caused more dysfunction, I think is the primary reason for mass shootings. Kids that have been screwed up their whole life, they don't know how to interact socially, they get rejected by every girl they talk to, finally, boom, boom, boom. Anyway, aside from that, looking at it medically, scientifically, if you're going to have something succeed, you can't put billionaires out of business because it's never going to happen. Never, never, never are you going to put a billionaire out of business. Well, who's the billionaire here? The pharmaceuticals. So, I am in favor of promoting the concept, not of talking down vaccinations, but of talking up vitamin C. If you give large doses of vitamin C before, during, and after a vaccination, I guarantee you, you won't have one case of autism. You will completely nuke the toxic effect of the vaccine. And if there is any real benefit for the vaccine, you'll augment that by making more antibodies. So we just need to put this as a package. I mean, in this way, the pharmaceuticals can make their filthy goddamn money. But at least people's babies aren't having their brains destroyed. Okay? But I don't have an opinion. Uh, other things, enhanced nitric oxide. 
enhanced natural killer cell function, important in cancer, prostaglandins, enhanced pathogen killing effect. Uh, okay, now, while that's pretty impressive, vitamin C and pathogens, you know what's even more impressive? Vitamin C and toxins. Okay, I sort of put the cart ahead of the horse of the vaccines talking about the anti-toxic effect. But let me tell you, the anti-toxic effect is the single most inalienable property of vitamin C. I'll tell you why a little bit later on down the road, but I will tell you that vitamin C, if it gains access to a toxin and the right doses, physical approximation, molecule to molecule, it will 100% neutralize every toxin known to man. I don't care what the chemical structure is. When I first ran across this, it was very hard for me to deal with it because I like to understand things. I mean, I definitely accept it. It was very clear cut that vitamin C neutralizes all toxic presentations. But I didn't know why. I said, how can one single tiny molecule neutralize the toxicity of hundreds of thousands of things of different molecular structure? That made no sense. But, think about it more, what it has to mean, and it does mean this, but what it has to mean when you're reasoning this out is that all of those different structured toxins by a final common denominator are inflicting their toxicity. And that final common denominator is oxidation. When a biomolecule is oxidized, has lost electrons, it's no longer functional. And if you have a ton of dysfunctional or non-functional biomolecules, you have disease. Oxidative stress doesn't cause disease. Oxidative stress is disease. All of them, 100% of them. This is one of the most important concepts I hope you take out of this, is that all diseases are increased numbers, concentrations, and distributions of oxidized biomolecules. And when by some wonderful clinical protocol, you can reduce all those biomolecules back to normal, you've got a cure. Or you've got a partial resolution depending on how well you do it. And that's it. As simple as that is, of course, treating it is very complex. But the denominator in disease is simple. It's oxidation. Now, <clears throat> what's vitamin C been proven to do? Neutralize the toxicity of all the toxic elements, mercury, lead, chromium, etc., Venoms, snake bite, alcohol. Uh, I don't want to encourage you to get blitz and then go do 100 grams of vitamin C IV, but it just might work. <laughs> Barbiturates. All of these have great stories behind it, but I have a large amount of information to give you, so you can review that later. Toxic mushrooms. Some of the most potent things known. Man. I will tell you this little anecdote. The guy, a Frenchman, that discovered that vitamin C neutralized the toxicity of Amanita phylloides, the super toxic mushroom death cat, started talking around his country just like this. And then he'd take three times the fatal dose of mushrooms and then take his vitamin C. Well, there's a lot of different things that could be going on in the body at the same time, so I'm not into tempting fate quite like that. But uh, suffice it to say, this was a man of his convictions. Pesticides, strychnine. Now, definite benefits in Lyme, AIDS, chronic hepatitis. Our general experience with these has been, and it usually takes somebody that has to have a little bit more money because insurance doesn't cover anything that's not mainstream. So you have patients, you have cancer patients that want to have IV vitamin C, but they don't have $5,000 for three months worth of therapy, 
and instead they accept $100,000 worth of chemotherapy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because that's what the uh, that's what the insurance company covers. Okay. Well, when you continue vitamin C along with the metabolic support agents that I'll tell you about in a moment, you bring the immune system up to such a level that you either do one of two things. You either actually cure the Lyme, the AIDS, the chronic hepatitis, or you strengthen the immune system to the point that you peacefully coexist with your infection for the rest of your life. My new book, After Magnesium, I'm already working on it. Basically, the, more or less, the, the title is going to be Pathogens Cause All Disease. But they're not necessarily gross infections. They're colonizations of pathogens in the Alzheimer brain. They're colonizations of pathogens in the Parkinson brain, in different tissues. The only thing that really astronomically supplies toxins, which are pro-oxidant, in high volume to a different tissue, is a pathogen. That's why infections are bad. They produce oxidants, pro-oxidants, toxins. Pro-oxidant pro is toxin, toxin is pro-oxidant. They're the same thing. Do you know Paul E. Wall? The, uh, Who? The Paul E. Wall. No, I don't know. He wrote about, you might want to look that up. He looked, wrote the uh, New Germ Theory in the Atlantic. Okay. I mean, his whole thesis is that all diseases are tied, and he's written many papers. Uh, I've sort of suspected this, or, or I was leaning toward this, but we now have an incredible amount of data coming out every day where they're doing biopsies of dis different tissues sure. and, and using uh, the sophisticated PCR testing, and they're seeing oral pathogens everywhere in the body. We just do IgG titers on everybody. You know, okay. I can do a pneumonia panel for $3. You know, it's like Where we have identified the pathogens so far, Alzheimer's brain tissue, myocardium in heart disease patients, pericardial fluid in heart disease patients, coronary arteries in coronary artery disease patients, uh, carotid plaque, plaque anywhere else where you have atherosclerosis, uh, aneurysms ruptured and unruptured. Uh, obviously, with all mouth cancers, breast lesions, benign or malignant, ulcer disease, colon cancers, and colon conditions. And my, my assertion is the more you look, the more you're going to find. Let me add I to the list because my, my mentor was an ophthalmologist of Harvard okay. doing um, infectious testing in the 1980s on wow. macular disease, glaucoma. Early on with the focal infection theory that the yeah. dentists say has been dismissed, <laughs> I don't know. they had a list of like about 30 ocular diseases and they all related to infection. Not surprising, look. Here's your teeth in your mouth. Where's your freaking eye? <laughs> Pretty right. close. Right next to your brain. Right next to your brain. And right next to the garbage can vacuum cleaner, your thyroid gland. Okay? All the minimal hypothyroidism we see. That's because our, our thyroid gland is working overload just trying to get rid of the crap that we push through it every day. Common cold, TB, pertussis. Neutralizes radiation toxicity. Whatever the source of radiation is, the only thing that he does to harm you is oxidized biomolecules. That's it. And Dr. Yadagasawa in Japan did some work on this, has some nice little studies. So, let me outline then some practical considerations about vitamin C. Number one, as we saw, it significantly enhances immune function. Number two, it has direct antipathogen properties. It gets inside the pathogen, just like a cancer cell inside the pathogen, where there's large amounts of iron. It shuttles through the iron, breaks down hydrogen peroxide in something called the Fenton reaction, and then it lyses the, the pathogen or it lyses the cancer cell. It neutralizes toxins. 
it repairs oxidized biomolecules. It reduces them. It gives up electrons. And you see, it's important to understand a biomolecule does not have a disease. It does not have Alzheimer's. It does not have ulcer disease. It does not have liver disease. It is not disease. It's just either oxidized or not oxidized. That's it. Also, in dealing with infections, all infections consume vitamin C, so you want to bring that up. And finally, just keep in mind, I really believe, as I've thought about this, that things have evolved over time, that the only completely non-toxic substance on the planet is vitamin C. Everything else has toxicity. Everything. Depending on dose, depending on mouth concentration. Vitamin C, zero. Okay? Vitamin C is the fuel on which every cell in your body runs. So taking too much like vitamin C is like eating too much quality organic food. Okay? Oh, and I like to point this out. If you take a huge amount of something and you die, do you want to conclude that substance is toxic? That's a pretty bad outcome. Well, if you drink three or four gallons of water in half an hour, you'll die. Good old water. So you dilute out the brain, dilute out the, the electrolytes, go into seizures, brain edema, and you die. So there is no established dose of vitamin C above which is toxic. None. Okay. So, the first proposal proposition is that I don't care what you're treating, how you're treating it, I don't care how effective your protocol always is, vitamin C should always be part of that treatment protocol, 100% of the time. Okay? And by many different mechanisms, vitamin C will always augment what you're already doing. Um, I'm not as anti-anti-antibiotics anti as a lot of people are. Uh, they do have their place. I've had times when I've struggled with something, taking a lot of vitamin C, and it wasn't until I added a little cephalosporin that I came out of But conversely, there's no reason to go straight to the antibiotics because 9 out of 10 times vitamin C will take you out of it. And you don't need to deal with potential antibiotic toxicity. You don't have to deal with the antibiotic completely screwing over your gut flora. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the horrible impact of abnormal gut flora, plus a brand new way to deal with it. So, what are the, in my opinion, prominent promoters of all chronic degenerative diseases? Number one, far and away, number one. Infections, and of infections, far and away, 90-95% clinical significance, oral cavity. Oral cavity mainly is talking about infected gums, infected teeth, root canals, and other teeth that are silently infected. That's what the book Hidden Epidemic is about. Uh, we have a few copies left. Anybody that wants one, you can get one. And infected tonsils. That's a real bag of worms there, and I'm, I'm working with several people. I'm trying to find a way to reliably diagnose chronically affected tonsils because they look normal. I'm not talking about chronic tonsillitis. I'm talking about tonsils that have been draining infected teeth for years and they're grossly abscessed inside, but they're not enlarged and they look fine. Okay, Dr. Joseph Bissell's established many years ago in the 1950s that he had a substantial number of his chronic cancer patients die, even after I got all their stuff taken out and did his special cancer treatment therapy, but all those heart attacks stopped when he started doing tonsillectomies on everybody. Now I'm not saying go straight to a tonsillectomy, but I'm telling you, 
if you've had infected teeth, if you've had root canals, and they're out, and you're still having syndromes consistent with the seeding of your body with pathogens 24-7, you should seriously consider tonsillectomy, but only after you do a series of direct ozone injections into the tonsils. This does appear to help these things resolve a significant percentage of the time. Have you had like antibiotics with the tonsillitis? No. Okay. Not tonsillitis. I'm not talking about tonsillitis. Just yeah. tonsil infection. And, yeah, chronically abscessed tonsils. Yeah. Quickly, I don't want to take up a lot of time with my own anecdote, but I got chest pain seven years ago, running after my little dog. I'm a cardiologist. I said, son of a bitch, you're getting ready to have the big one. <laughs> And I said, well, you better sit down, and in the next 10, <laughs> next 10 minutes, you're either going to die or it's going to go away. It went away. I had been reading Dr. Issel's stuff, <clears throat> and I had been tracking an elevated CRP for years. I do a lot of vitamin Z and come down, then it go back up again. I do this and come down, go back up again. I get an infected tooth, take it out, and go down, come back up again. I said, Son of a bee. When I read Issel's stuff, I said, There's no way I'm dropping dead of a heart attack with these two tonsils still in my mouth. Called my ENT the next day, uh, and <laughs> you don't need to twist a surgeon's arm to do surgery. In case you. Well, Tom, you know, you've never had tonsillitis. Yeah, yeah, I've had, to I've had tonsillitis a lot. I just. It's just, but it's gone away now, and I don't want to deal with it anymore. Well, okay, come on in, we'll get him out. Went in, got him out, and he came to see me a couple hours after the procedure. Now, mind you, my tonsils, look, he told me, they looked perfectly normal, but maybe they were a little bit enlarged. That's it. Normal looking, slightly enlarged. And I, I said, well, well, uh, Doc, what's going on? He said, well, it's something pretty impressive. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we got the tonsils out. He said, but when I grabbed the left tonsil, now, the left tonsil was on the same side as the root canal I had gotten done 15 years earlier, but had already been extracted for 10 years. So the tonsil wasn't being fed any more pathogens for 10 years. It could not cure itself in 10 years. So he said, when I grabbed that left tonsil, pus started coming out. And then after the tonsillectomy, CRP went down, stayed down. Okay. So I don't recommend a tonsillectomy lightly. It's far and away the most miserable experience I ever had. The, the procedure nearly killed me. Not, uh, well, no. The post-procedure nearly killed me. The procedure went like a snap. went snap. Okay. Exogenous toxins. Toxic iron stats. I couldn't believe it on Fox and Friends this morning while well, I'm getting ready. They had a new science Mr. Wizard doing some crap. You know, he's making little lava lamps, that's fine. And then he said, I'm going to show you the iron in your cereal. I said, what? I don't know how many of you know this. I did this 20 years ago about the metallic iron filings they put in your freaking cereal. Metallic iron filings. Well, these were such idiots. The guy said, and he pulled it out with a magnet, with total cereal. Actually, it was total cereal, too, just like I used. I think the guy might have seen my video. I'm not sure. Pulled the iron filings. See, there it is. Metallic iron filings they put in your food. And nobody is appalled. That's proof to you of the, all the good iron they're putting in your, in your I said, oh, I, said, I just tend to shake my head a little bit, okay? It's tough enough to advance science without being surrounded by idiots. Amen. I try not to be arrogant when I say that, but that's how I feel. So, toxic iron stats, just about everybody has that. Okay? Your ferritin should be below 20. Don't believe any BS about that. It should be below 20 with a normal CBC. You can't have a ferritin level too low with the reflection of your iron stores 
if your CBC, your blood count is normal. Dietary toxin exposures, poor digestion. The toxins that are produced in a putrefying gut, you're a lot better off eating McDonald's every day with perfect digestion than you are eating a perfect organic diet with horrible digestion and a bowel movement every three or four days. Far worse off. Obviously, you want quality food properly digested. That's the goal. And finally, hormone imbalances. Now, this is done as a throwaway. I'll show you some evidence later on. If you are slightly low in your thyroid status, which most people are, that's why the focal infections in your mouth take hold throughout your body. Because you have a chronic body-wide increased oxidative stress that allows pathogens to disseminate and take hold and grow in other spaces. But when you perfectly adjust your thyroid function, I'll show you some information, you keep focal infections focal. It's almost unrealistic these days to expect to have every pathogen out of your body. But you need to understand what optimizes your immune status and optimizes the strength and resilience of your tissues because given the proper hormone support, your body will keep local infection full. Now, I've scattered throughout this. Let me give you a little consolidation now on what I call the shared pathology of all chronic degenerative diseases. In addition to calling about oxidative stress, oxidized biomolecules, it's primarily intracellular increased oxidative stress. All diseases have increased numbers of oxidized biomolecules inside the cells. That's the pathognomonic, that's the sine qua non, that's the essential aspect of all diseases. In whatever cells that are dysfunctional or diseased, you have increased intracellular oxidative stress. Now, you can have oxidative stress outside, extracellular, but that's generally a secondary phenomenon. You're really never going to have a normal cell inside an abnormal extracellular milieu. You might have both, but if you just have one, it's inside the cell. And it's also the marker of normalcy. If you, by your protocol, can restore intracellular oxidative stress back to the normal physiological level, you have a normal cell. It can no longer be infected. It can no longer be a cancer cell. It can no longer be any cell associated with the disease or pathology. So. Interestingly enough, vitamin C is the fuel of all the cells of the body. It's also the, the focal point of all reduction, oxidation, redox biology. A prooxidant or a toxin, synonyms, they all either directly oxidize or cause to be oxidized by our molecules. So they either directly take a molecule from, or more from a, from a biomolecule and make it inactive, or by another mechanism, it ends up oxidizing the biomolecule. On the other hand, antioxidant is the electron donor. And very quickly, you know, you might ask, well, when you take the electron, when vitamin C donates its electron, it's oxidized. So it's a toxin. Technically, yes. Oxidized biomolecule, you can say, has a toxic electron robbing property. But the big difference is a quality antioxidant gives and takes, gives and takes, gives and takes, gives and takes, gives and takes. It promotes electron flow. High oxidant levels promote normal microcurrents inside your cell, which promote normal transmembrane voltages. On the other hand, that's because the oxidized state of vitamin C and the reduced state of vitamin C are biochemically almost equally stable. 
So, so it doesn't go to one side and stay there. On the other hand, if you a toxin takes an electron and becomes vastly more stable and will never give that electron up. So the good antioxidant is give and take, give and take, give and take. Toxin takes and holds. Takes and holds. So the microcurrents inside the cell get stopped. Oxidative stress goes up. So the three, well actually not three, really the two. The primary things that you need to be concerned in the management of all patients are what provides toxins and what provides antioxidants. So pathogens are your major prooxidant provider. Everything about an infection is prooxidant in nature. The only time an infection is going to kill you with something other than massively increased oxidative stress is if the infection is, let's say, reproducing alongside a large blood vessel and the oxidation erodes through the blood vessel and you die of hemorrhage. Other than that, all infections kill you by huge amounts of oxidative stress, very large numbers of oxidized biomolecules, no exceptions. I mean, Ebola, in these Ebola patients, they probably don't have three vitamin C molecules left by the time they die. And what do they die of? Well, they don't, they don't erode away big vessels, they erode away small vessels, so they die of hemorrhage. What are they called? The hemorrhagic fevers. <clears throat> and this sort of quantifies better what I was saying about oxidized biomolecules. The determinants of a biomolecule affects the disease. Which biomolecules are oxidized? You have RNA, DNA, proteins, sugars, uh, enzymes, all of these are biomolecules. So which biomolecules are oxidized? Where are they located? Uh, is there a minimal, moderate, or large number oxidized? And how long have they, have they been oxidized without being reduced? Those are your factors. Uh, quick example. Cyanide and mercury. All right? Cyanide kills you in a minute. Mercury kills you in 30 years. But they're both toxins, and they both inflict their damage by oxidation. The thing about cyanide is you inhale it, goes straight into the respiratory epithelium, goes into the Krebs cycle, poisons, oxidizes critical enzymes necessary for, necessary for oxygen metabolism, and you die of oxygen starvation in a minute or two. Mercury, toxic, but not that acutely toxic, gets in your tissues, accumulates your brain for 30 years until your amalgams cause you to finally stop being able to walk and you have MS in a wheelchair. So, what are then the principles? Prevent or minimize new toxins. Neutralize existing toxins. Excrete toxins that are inside your body in as non-toxic a fashion as possible. Detoxification can sometimes be a retoxifying process. Resolve infections or keep infections focal. Supplement optimally and really biggie on number six. I'm going to tell you the information I have on hormones. A lot of docs do a lot of good things, integrative docs, but there's still some basics that are being missed. You know, they say, oh, you're too old for estrogen or you're too old for testosterone. If you're a man or a woman of any age and you're worth treating, you're worth restoring sex hormones to the normal level. Because whatever you're treating is going to kill them a whole lot quicker if those levels stay low than if you bring them into the normal range. Not high normal, normal. You know, high normal, that's like putting, for an old man, that's like putting rocket fuel in a, in a, in a Model T. You got to be careful. Now, good, best reaction I've had to that one in a while. Uh, so, I just told you what determines all disease is increased 
intracellular, inside the cell, oxidative stress, or increased concentrations of oxidized biomolecules. What are the four, actually, as you'll see, three primary determinants of this? It's your intracellular levels of calcium, your intracellular levels of magnesium, your intracellular levels of vitamin C, and your intracellular levels of glutathione. glutathione. Whatever elevates or depresses those levels will not elevate calcium. Whatever elevates or depresses magnesium, C, and glutathione, if it elevates it, you're getting healthier. If it depresses it, you're getting sicker. Period. That's simple. Calcium. Calcium is so freaking toxic. Unfortunately, it's the number one supplement on the planet. So many women, especially women, men take it too, but especially women, targeted for their osteoporosis or their osteoporosis predilections, are doing their level best to improve their health or get healthy, and all they're doing is accelerating their, their pathway toward cancer and heart attack. Above a minimal level of intake, Calcium is one of the most toxic substances you could possibly ingest. I call calcium, uh, iron, and copper the three toxic nutrients. They're all essential for life and normal function at low levels. And ironically enough, they're all essential for cell death at higher levels. Okay? And I don't have time to go through all of it. This is in my book, Death by Calcium, but all the data is there. You supplement the calcium, you die sooner. Period. Large studies. 20 years, 20,000 people, prospective. Oh, and there, there's, a, there's one there. Increased calcium supplement by any mechanism. That's your main study. Increases all cause mortality. Your death from any cause. Death from any cause because the calcium abnormality is present in every cell in your body. It just doesn't focus on one particular area. That's why if you do something that positively pulls calcium out, you make all the cells more normal and you make all diseases more manageable. On the other hand, the other direction, you increase your chance of deaths from anything. It doesn't matter what the cell type is. Magnesium. Romulus and Remus. Yin and Yang. That's calcium and magnesium. They're the two brothers that never got along. They're natural antagonists. You cannot have high levels of calcium and magnesium. You cannot have low levels of calcium and magnesium. One is up, the other's down. And if you want to bring the one that's up down, you elevate the levels of the other one. Natural antagonists in tissues. Magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker. Okay? Now, as I said before, we see the extra calcium increases all cause mortality, more magnesium decreases all cause mortality. Not a big surprise. Vitamin C, you can help things work quicker with the vitamin C, with the magnesium and the calcium if you can find a way to get vitamin C inside the cell. That might be your primary marker of how normal a cell is, is how close you are to having a normal level of vitamin C. In it. Okay? Uh, but it's much easier to manipulate the vitamin, the, the magnesium as well because if you're not promoting calcium egress with magnesium intake, you're going to be much less effective with your vitamin C supplementation. Okay, so they all work hand in hand. Interestingly enough, uh, where there's very little vitamin C, you have scurvy. Where there's body-wide or focal. And the reason diabetics have such horrible cellular disease macular degeneration, eye problems, retinopathy, is because the worst diabetics have the worst intracellular scurvy. Why? 
vitamin C and glucose compete with each other for uptake into the cell. So you have massive levels of glucose, practically no vitamin C gets inside the cell. Glutathione, even though it's the most important and most concentrated intracellular antioxidant, getting its levels up really relies primarily on normalization of the magnesium and the C. It, it then comes along secondarily. That said, I mean, you can push it a little bit with, with uh, successive supplemental forms of glutathione, but the areas to focus on are stopping the calcium, supplementation, or foods, and the degree to which, I can't go into all this with the time we have left, it's all covered in the book. Stopping the calcium, minimizing the calcium intake, completely stopping every milligram of supplemental calcium. I mean, don't take any supplemental calcium. Okay. And along with good magnesium and vitamin C, those are the, those are the three, th three, th three things you concentrate on most to get to this state of optimal cellular health. Hormones and oxidative stress. <clears throat> now this is my opinion. It's my opinion that it's a good way to regard hormones conceptually as having primarily two functions. They positively modulate or improve normal metabolism, accelerate normal cell reactions. And number two, their second primary function is to minimize or normalize increased intracellular oxidative stress. I would submit to you that all hormones that we know of share these two qualities. They may do some other things too, but they share these two qualities. Your big hormones, in my opinion. Insulin, hydrocortisone, thyroid hormone, estrogen and testosterone. By virtue of the way they affect cellular metabolism, it's also useful to regard vitamin C and magnesium as having hormonal-like qualities as well. I know they're not hormones, but in terms of clinical impact on intracellular oxidative stress, which basically, as I'm telling you, is the final common denominator of all disease, it's good to think of all of these things in a package when you're trying to construct an optimal protocol for getting hold of a chronic disease or a chronic infection or preventing chronic disease from starting. And that's why I say always think of combinations of the above six agents in treating nearly all medical conditions, including infections. <clears throat> now you want as much active produced vitamin C inside the cell as possible. That's your goal. Uh, okay, now. So the things you want to achieve with an optimal protocol, you want to, as best as possible, normalize the levels of these critical hormones, especially thyroid and the sex hormone. Number two, you want to, as best as possible, eliminate focal infections. 95% plus what are inside the mouth in the form of a root canal treated tooth or in the form of a very common, that's what this book talks about, a very common asymptomatically pain-free infected tooth, which clinically studies show are even more toxic than root canals. That's why everybody that wants to do, do right by themselves and their patients, you need the 3D cone beam examination of the mouth to see if you have teeth that are infected that feel fine. Because you may feel fine, but if that tooth is infected with a clearly definable abscess, your days are limited. At least your days of good health are limited. Optimal body-wide levels of magnesium, important to understand magnesium, unlike vitamin C, does accumulate. Vitamin C washes out quick, magnesium gets inside and concentrates inside your cells. Optimal digestion, I'll give you a few thoughts on that, and optimal additional supplementation. Estrogen, one of the reasons it works so well. It's a calcium channel blocker, 
and it effectively raises intracellular magnesium levels. See how these hormones play into all of this. It's a powerful anti-inflammatory agent. <clears throat> it also lessens, reduces the amount of magnesium you're wasting in your urine. And it decreases all-cause mortality as you bring it from abnormal levels into the normal range. Similar with testosterone, calcium channel blocker, anti-inflammatory, decreases all-cause mortality, lessens insulin resistance. It also works as sort of a master hormone to help optimize the function of the other hormones. Insulin. Oh. It's very possible. I'll make sort of a radical statement here. It's very impossible these two properties of insulin I'm going to tell you about are more important than its effects on glucose. Okay? Vitamin, uh, insulin directly promotes the uptake of magnesium and vitamin C inside the cell. I told you those are the two most critical factors for a healthy cell. If you do that and you get those levels fine, the glucose is going to come in as well. Okay? But what happens, let's say, when you have the quote-unquote insulin-resistant diabetic? <clears throat> you keep going up and up and up and on the insulin, no effect. Well, guess what? They're severely deficient in magnesium, and when you start giving large amounts of magnesium, the insulin starts working. You've got to keep this as a package. You just can't get focused on one spot or you're going to miss the boat. Also, wow, talk about, uh, always like to say, the best way to bury a vital, critical piece of medical information forever is to publish it in the mainstream medical literature. <laughs> it's gone. Those, 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 uh, those, those uh, researchers have no interest at all in doing anything other than publishing their paper. And doctors have no interest at all in picking up a new fact and using this thing between their shoulders called a brain, theoretically. Okay? Well, and then they say, if you say, well, let's use this. Well, where's the double-blind, prospective, placebo-controlled, long-term study showing this benefit? Well, guess what? <clears throat> In the literature, over the 80 years or so since insulin has been around, they have a dozen prospective, randomized, long-term, placebo-controlled trials on people, not animals, with uh, bed sores and other horrible wounds that won't heal, and they show that insulin massively improves healing, both systemically and topically. Why would it do that? What does insulin do? It pulls in magnesium, it pulls in vitamin C, and, you're, and you start healing. So, with that in mind, how many wound care centers around the world do you think routinely use insulin? Who said? They've got it all there, but it's in the mainstream literature, and unless somebody wants to write a book and work hard on getting the book and the information out there, that information is DOA and stays in there. <clears throat> Hydrocortisone, powerful anti-inflammatory, also strongly enhances vitamin C uptake. It's my opinion that the primary role of hydrocortisone is its property of pulling insulin into the cell. There's a lot of different mechanisms you can go through, but in terms of the final common denominator, and we showed this, this is a study from the Reardon Clinic. Uh, we showed intracellular levels of vitamin C skyrocketed <coughs> with the co-administration of hydrocortisone. Also, calcium channel blocker. So, thyroid hormone, very important. Uh, 
subclinical hypothyroidism substantially increases body-wide oxidative stress. With traditional thyroid testing looking like it's normal. Okay? I'm not out per se to offend endocrinologists, but the traditional thyroid tests are close to being worthless. But there are tests that do exist where you can get the information that you need. Okay, uh, well, I mentioned all this. Let me go into the thyroid. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Broda Barnes in the 1970s worked with some 1,500 patients over a 20-year period. All he did, all he did, was by through sophisticated temperature regulation uh, and clinical evaluation using whole thyroid, brought minimally hypothyroid patients into a euthyroid or normal thyroid state. Now, these were regular old patients. They smoked, they drank, they had diabetes, they, uh, they had root canals, they had infected teeth. He wasn't addressing any of that, but they had just as much of that as the general population. Over a 20 year period, 1,500 patients, 20 year period, 1,500 patients, he had four heart attacks. The Framingham study showed it should have been 80. The direct conclusion, the inescapable conclusion, in my opinion, is that normal thyroid function is your single most critical factor in keeping focal infections focal. Because I don't have this slide here, but let me tell you about this slide real quick. In, in a study of patients that had coronary artery disease, 38, they did a Roto-Rooter and they carved out the atherosclerotic plaque and then examined the atherosclerotic plaque with PCR testing for pathogens. And they found all the periodontal pathogens, viruses, fungi, in 38 out of 38. Okay? Again, pretty close to 100%. So, point being is, all the coronary artery disease patients have chronically colonized, pathogen-ridden endothelium. And even if you can't get enough vitamin C in there, it would appear that keeping your thyroid status completely normal gives enough of a lessening effect on the oxidative stress to keep those new pathogens from taking hold. Very impressive stuff. Now, one of the reasons why traditional thyroid testings are pretty close to worthless is, and this may sound silly, but they're really just looking at the thyroid gland. Your active form of thyroid hormone is T3. The thyroid gland produces T4, which is almost <coughs> inactive. Now, T4 needs to be converted to T3 for the T3 to have its positive effect on the cells. Roughly 50%, 15, excuse me, 15 percent of T4 to T3 conversion takes place inside uh, inside the thyroid gland. The other 85 percent takes place in every cell throughout your body by virtue of enzymes called deiodinases. T4 has four iodines, and you have a deiodinase that pulls one off, and you got T3. Or if you have excess oxidative stress going on. That deiodinase is suppressed, and you have another deiodinase that takes off the other iodine, and you have reverse T3. The reverse T3 is a key that fits in the lock, but doesn't open the lock. Okay? It fits, but it's non functional. So by measuring reverse T3 and regular T3 and looking at their ratio, we have a very clear-cut reflection of body-wide thyroid status, not thyroid gland thyroid status. Does it really matter what's going on in the thyroid gland? Uh, 
if it's not if it's if it's functioning normally inside the cells. All right, so do that. What is that proper ratio? I'm gonna go with that. Good question. Uh, well, there you go. The proper ratio is 18 to 1 to 20 to 1. But I'm, I'm giving an example in a moment. The temperature is very important if you measure it well. I don't have this slide, but they make really nice laser... I scared the hell out of my wife once. I said, look at this, honey. I pulled up my laser device. And she, I mean, for 10 seconds, she thought I was going to shoot her. Oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, <laughs> I, you, I, it works for machines, anything. As a matter of fact, it has more machine applications. You, you see really quick if part of a machine is overheated. Bunk, 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 bunk. Well, make sure the mouth has not had ice or been eating or chewing for five minutes. And then, oh, boom, boom. You got a perfect temperature. You don't have this thermometer BS. Or you're not sitting there saying, well, let me measure the armpits. But anyway, tracking this accurately along with the thyroid function, along with clinical evaluation. I mean, you can't ignore if your patient is continuing to have classical hypothyroid symptoms and all the tests of the temperature look good, then you probably still need a little more thyroid uh, hormone. So, here's a little... We see here... Uh, the reverse T3 is in nanograms per deciliter, and for some reason the free T3 is in picograms per milliliter. I'll spare you the torture. You just take the free T3, 3.1, multiply it by 100, so you have 310, and then divide it by the reverse T3, and so here's a ratio of 16.8, a little bit low. A little bit low. And the other point to remember, as a clinician, you can affect this ratio by two primary things. By depressed free 3 T3, so depressed thyroid effect in the cell, or by increased reverse T3, increased oxidative stress throughout the body. We don't have the data yet, but Dr. Honeyhackey and I here in clinic think that when we put it all together, the reverse T3 level by itself is going to be one of your most sensitive indexes of body-wide oxidative stress. Probably probably far better than CRP. And pronologists won't do it, though. <laughs> okay, well. No, well you, you could ask them to do it, and they won't well, do it. Well, you go to LabCorp. You get a LabCorp. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it doesn't cost that much, you know. Yeah, yeah. okay, so yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, well, I won't say that on tape. <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> you got to remember, this stuff gets on YouTube, so I <laughs> it ended the world. Okay, so point being is each patient is going to be different, even if their ratio is abnormal as to how hard you push on the thyroid or how hard you look for sources of increased oxidative stress. And many times when you get rid of all the toxins, and then the T3 is still a little bit low, they're going to need to be on thyroid for life. But just, but the other, other thing pertains as well. Oftentimes, when you get rid of the affected teeth or tonsils or whatever, that load gets taken off the thyroid gland, especially if you're taking iodorol. You need to take iodine. You need to take iodorol. That's one of the top five supplements. That's magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin K2, and iodine. I, I own a role. You need to be on all five no matter what else you take. Sometimes you can get a normalization of the thyroid function. The thyroid gland detoxes itself well enough. Detox, the iodine will push out the bromine contaminants and you'll get better thyroid function gradually over time. Okay. Now, a little few points about magnesium. Unlike vitamin C, uh, roughly 99% of magnesium is inside the cells, intracellular. Actually, more than 99%, it's like 99.5 or 6%. 
the intracellular concentration of magnesium is 10,000 fold higher than the extracellular. And the opposite is true for calcium. Extracellular calcium is 10,000 fold more concentrated than intracellular. So again, you see the yin and the yang here. However, of the intracellular, only 5% of the magnesium is in the cytoplasm. The other 95% is inside the mitochondria. Now, simplistically speaking, what do my mitochondria do? So that's why all the low magnesium... Um, well, let me, let me step back. I'm going to tell you right now, and this is presented in the book as best I can. Many diseases are caused by magnesium deficiency, and 100% of diseases are worsened by magnesium deficiency. No exceptions. I can tell you, for example, migraine is almost 100% a chronic deficiency of magnesium. Okay. It's amazing, too, how... Well, I guess not amazing anymore. How you see all the studies that take a, a, a migraine status migranosis patient. They're just having the migraine won't go away. And they use X, they use Y, they use Z, they use Q, they use R, they use S, and then finally they use magnesium and, and the headache goes away. But you'll never see them use the magnesium first. Just uh, again. I have to limit my commentary. So, and interestingly enough, uh, your muscles are your big stores of energy too. And that's where they do biopsies to look at reflective magnesium status. So, I think I have it on another slide, but if I don't, I'll just tell you now. I consider there to be only two valid tests, truly valid tests for magnesium status in your body. Number one is the serum level of magnesium. Now, that's worthless if it's normal, but it's highly valuable if it's low. If it's low, you're really low in magnesium. You're low in your blood, you're low inside your cells, you're low in your mitochondria, you are low everywhere and the most critical mineral in your body and probably co-critical factor in your health as vitamin C. Now, when the serum level is normal range, you might be normal in your body status, but highly unlikely. Then you have to look at intracellular status. They have a bunch of stuff like red blood cell RBCs. Well, red blood cells don't have subcellular organelles. They don't have mitochondria, so they're not really a reflection too much of your, of your body's true status of magnesium. The true ways you find it are biopsy. Okay, they biopsy muscles, this out of the other. Well, nobody wants to get a needle stuck in their thigh to take out a piece of muscle to see if they're magnesium. They have a sublingual cell test called the Exatest, E X A T E S T dot com, Exatest.com. And swab, some, swab under the tongue and then send it off, and you can clearly see your intracellular content of magnesium. And they've actually correlated this test with biopsies and found a very good correlation that they are reflecting the body status of magnesium. Uh, Right now, there's only one liposome encapsulated form of magnesium, but I can tell you that we're seeing it work very, very well. Okay. And in my opinion, from a consultant to the company that sells it, but right now there's no competitors. Nobody else has encapsulated magnesium, so I can talk about liposome encapsulated magnesium generically, but I'm obviously referring only to one, one brand, but boy, does it work well. There's no bowel tolerance. And you actually have to be, if you're really taking over a long period of time, you have to be concerned, just like with intravenous, that you can build up too much. It's not going to suddenly make you hypotensive, but it will drop your blood pressure down over time, 
so that you might feel tired all day long. Well, that's the time to get your exit test and see if you've truly got your magnesium levels inside your cells normal, and then you can back off on your supplementation to uh, a pack a couple times a week or something like that. Uh, nebulization. One of the, now this is all recent for me, four or five months. One of the most enormously beneficial and little used therapies there exists. And it's an old therapy, it's been around for many hundreds of years, okay. And this has to do with the bile too. Now, I don't have all the studies here, but I can tell you that Infected gums, peritonal disease, is correlated, cause and effect, correlated with just about every disease that's been studied. Hey, well, you're, you're letting pathogens out into the body with their toxins. You're colonizing. You're not infecting, you're colonizing. You have three different forms, in my opinion, of pathogen presence. You have an acute body-wide infection, the flu. You have focal infections with abscesses, root canals that infect the teeth and tonsils. Or you have the ongoing presence of pathogens without active proliferation and without the active form of abscesses, but with the form of biofilms coating on top of them and keeping them from being eradicated. Three forms. And in my opinion, I'm beginning to see that the major form, well, I'm not going to minimize root canals. So, you know, the major form after root canals and infected teeth are, and when they're saying, well, what else can I do? I've got rid of all my infected teeth, and it's out of the other. Well, your infected gums could still be seeding your gut. You've got to remember, everything that goes on in your mouth and sinuses, you swallow. And pathogens and toxins don't magically disappear because you swallow them. Okay. Now, anecdotally, I have found profoundly positive response, and I have a newsletter on this if you go to orthomolecular.org. The first article on there is Reboot Your Gut, and I have about 70 references for everything I talk about there, but let me just tell you that. Abnormal gut floors can be resolved very quickly in most people. Now, you know, when you've had long-standing disease processes and Crohn's and this out of the other, I'm not going to say all this is going to magically go away. But most people with minimal bowel symptoms, diarrhea, upset stomach, constipation, you name it, that can be resolved, I believe, very quickly in most people. But what you do is you got to stop, like Dr. Dr. Huggins used to say, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. How do you expect your gut, with probiotics or anything else, to ever normalize and stay normalized if you're still swallowing the pathogens and the toxins 24-7, like the young people like to say? Okay? You can't. Now, the three most effective things that I've found for this, there might be more, I don't know. It's good to take a quality probiotic while you're doing this, so you're, you're supplying some new seeds for something to develop, but that's not going to be a monotherapy and that's not going to last. One of the most, two of the most then underdone things are your tongue. People's tongues are disgusting. They've got fungi, viruses, every type of pathogen under the sun, sitting under a huge biofilm. There's only one way to get it off. Tongue scrape. And you should tongue scrape at least twice a day. First thing in the morning and last thing at night. More often is fine, but minimum of two times because they've shown that these heavy tongue coatings by themselves increase CRP, okay? Which means they're affecting your body-wide oxidative stress. 
Now, they might be doing it by virtue of the fact that you're swallowing those pathogens and you're destroying your gut microbiome, and that's causing the increased CRP. I'm not going to say it's a direct thing, but it's definitely causing everything that's going on there. So tongue scraping uh, with appropriate bactericidal mouthwashes, and then nebulization, chronic colonizations. Once you get a cold, once the cold goes away, do you think your gut flora is normal? you think your, your, your throat? No, no, no. You just have low levels of pathogens waiting for the next opportunity to be reignited. But nebulizing with things like, I presently work with a nice combination of DMSO, sodium ascorbate, and magnesium chloride. There are many other things you can do with it. Sometimes I add hydrocortisone, sometimes I add insulin. Why? Well, I just showed you all those things pull vitamin C and magnesium into the cells. And if you pull that into the cells that are being affected by the infection, you're not only getting rid of the infection, but you're going to make them strong and resist future infection. One last anecdote. When I first started this, I started this because I had a chronic cough for 60 years. I get sick and tired of it. And I did this and son of a bee, my cough went away. And it all came up because of the research I was doing on the magnesium book. Well, <laughs> I want to tell you how quick, if you don't have a four plus abnormal gut, that your gut flora can normalize. Within 24 hours of doing several of these therapies, <coughs> I had the most perfect bowel movement I had in 68 years of my life. And as I say, it was like a dog in the woods. <coughs> Firm, well-formed, and also, I don't want to be indelicate, but once you understand the science, not much to wipe off, okay? Everything was perfect. I said, wow. I, I made this presentation at the Reardon Clinic, and my good friend, Dr. Ron Honeyhack, he started laughing when I said this. And he said, wait, I have a comment to make. I said, what, Dr. Ron? He said, well, I want to... I want to remind you of a quote from Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, there's nothing more overrated than sex and underrated than a good bomb movement. <laughs> but the point being is, that quickly, the flora can change. I mean, there'll be other conditions where you'll need weeks or months, maybe years, but Unless you have a chronic underlying bowel condition anatomically that's causing an ongoing problem, I think everybody can have a normal gut flora in a month or less. My opinion. Oh, giving vitamin C, adjunct therapies. <clears throat> We're combining it with different things now. A lot of information that shows that vitamin C does not suppress chemo. Yeah, if you take them together, one might neutralize the other, but you take them apart, they augment each other, <coughs> longer life, less symptoms. I mean, even on the sickest cancer patient on their deathbed, give them vitamin C because they're going to feel better for the rest of however they have left to live. Okay? Don't deny that. Don't say, well, I had something for you, but you're too sick to try it. No. I mean, that's like saying, you're too old, you're too sick now to eat. No. The whole purpose of what you're eating for is to get vitamin C and antioxidants into your body. Okay. Uh, this is my... Multi-C protocol, oral liposome, multigram sodium ascorbate powder, ascorbyl palmitate, which is fat-soluble, intermittent IV. They're now doing something at the Reardon Clinic where they hook you up with a little bladder and a lie in it, and you get a steady 24-hour infusion of vitamin C at home. And we're thinking this is going to bring things to just incredible new heights in terms of response for all chronic diseases, Lyme, and cancer. Uh, intramuscular, in agents that promote the production of vitamin C in the plasma. They have something out there called Formula 216. Website, formula216.com. 
and it has a nutrient polyphenol. I've been taking it for a year, and I can tell you it's my conclusion that for most people, the vast majority of people, it unblocks the the genetic deficiency that, so that human beings can start making their own vitamin C. In my opinion, everybody should be on this as well. Quickly, we've cured ozone. Uh, excuse me, we've cured Ebola with ozone and C. We've cured chikungunya, a horrible virus that wouldn't respond to anything. It takes young people and debilitates them with arthritis for months and years. Both my wife from Colombia and a friend of hers had this. And in one case, I gave ozone IV. I'm not supposed to do that, supposedly, but I gave it IV. And in my wife, I gave the intravenous hydrogen peroxide. Both of them were fine, symptomatically, before the treatment was even completed. Zika. No problem. Got the data on there. High dose intravenous vitamin C for Zika fever. So, vitamin C in any acute viral syndrome. Vitamin C in sepsis. We now know that vitamin C knocks out sepsis. Low doses. Very, very quickly. And let me sort of come to a conclusion with a little bit of legal editorializing here. What goes on every damn day on this planet is legalized manslaughter. Modern quote-unquote doctors exist in a protected legal class where they can kill their patient without consequences. Now, if you think that's a radical statement, what do you think withholding a life-saving therapy for no damn reason at all is other than at the very least, at the very least, negligent manslaughter. And for the sake of argument, that particular physician actually knew what vitamin C could do, then we go to homicide. Okay? And I will put this one on the YouTube. I think most physicians can be classified with one word. Evil. What, what did we all supposedly learn? Do no harm. Do no harm also means don't withhold life-saving therapy because you have too big a freaking ego to have a normal lay person say, Doctor, please give my dying patient a little bit of vitamin C. No. No use for it. Might be bad. Those people need to go to jail. Or at the very least, you know how you have Alcoholics going into education, they need to go into forced education. This might be another book down the road, not quite ready for it. So, we've done different IV pushes, mixed hydrocortisone, vitamin C and all, I've got some great results. So we play with it a lot. Hydrocortisone always helps a lot. And remember all the problems with cortisone, and side effects, those are long-term high dosage. Low-dose, short-term hydrocortisone makes everything better. Why? I believe because it pulls the vitamin C into the cells. Recap. There's a good word for you. Increased intracellular oxidative stress is the pathology common to all diseases and medical conditions. Number two, when enough reduced vitamin C gets inside the cells, increased intracellular oxidative stress no longer exists. Number three, there's multiple ways to optimize intracellular vitamin C, the multi-C. And number four, optimal magnesium and calcium metabolism along with a balancing of sex hormones and thyroid is essential for normal intracellular oxidative stress and an optimal clinical status. And it's kind of big. Yeah, you can make it out. There's my email address if you want a copy of the presentation. Thank you.